pleased to welcome you to the fifth installment of our webinar series. We are honored today to have a very eminent guest with us, His Excellency Judge Abdullahi Ahmed Yusuf, President of the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice is, of course, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, alongside the General Assembly, the Security Council, and the Economic and Social Council, among others. The court has two main functions. The first is to settle disputes between states that have consented to its jurisdiction, and the second is to provide advisory opinions on legal questions referred to it by other UN organs or specialized agencies authorized to seek such an advisory opinion. Judge Yusuf has been on the bench of the ICJ for over a decade now. Um, he was first elected as a judge in 2008. He became vice president of the court in 2015 and was then elected as the court's current president in February 2018. We can certainly say that Judge Yusuf is a towering figure in international law. Among many other accomplishments, he founded the African Institute of International Law as well as the African Yearbook of uh, International Law. He is a member of the Institut de Trois International, a member of the International Council for Commercial Arbitration or ICA Governing Board, and was formerly chief legal counsel to a number of intergovernmental organizations such as UNESCO and UNIDO. Judge Yusuf has authored uh, numerous publications on various aspects of international law, and he holds a PhD in international law from the Graduate Institute Geneva. Judge Yusuf, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and welcome to this webinar. Now, before we begin, I will just say a few words about Young Ica. Um, Young Ica was established in 2010 with a mission to open the doors of international arbitration to young practitioners. We have just celebrated uh, the organization's 10th year anniversary and we think that we're well on our way to fulfilling uh, our mission. Our membership is free and we have over 7,500 members around the world benefiting from the programs that we offer in four key areas. And these are, uh, first we have workshops and webinars uh, such as this that are focused on the development of practical skills relevant to the practice of international arbitration for early career professionals and students. Second, we offer full tuition scholarships for graduate degrees in dispute resolution at universities in the United States, in Switzerland and in China. Third, we have a blog platform uh, on which we publish a curated selection of contributions from, um, from our members on timely issues in international arbitration. And lastly, we have a mentorship program through which we pair participants with senior practitioners for two-year cycles. And during this period, they receive advice and career guidance. Um, and since I'm on this topic, I should mention that um, the current uh, cycle um, is currently open and people can apply to join uh, the mentorship program until the 1st of September. With that being said, uh, it is time to move on to the meat of this webinar, uh, which will take the form of a Q&A session with uh, Judge Yusuf. We're very happy to have received a number, a lot of questions from participants, and we've done our best to compile this and categorize them, uh, categorize them by theme. And if there are any questions that you would still like to ask uh, throughout the webinar, please feel free to type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please just be mindful that as a sitting ICJ judge, President Yusuf will be unable to address questions on certain themes, especially those pertaining to pending cases. So without further ado, I am going to lead us off with some questions about the ICJ and President Yusuf's career path. Uh, we will then be asking, Matthew will then be asking some questions about the role and practice of the ICJ, and panels will close us up with some questions touching on dispute settlement and international law in Africa. Uh, now to Judge Yusuf, welcome once again. Uh, please tell us, what is the role and importance of the ICJ in the contemporary system of international dispute settlement? Well, let me say first of all that I am very pleased to be here today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have uh, discussions, conversations, exchanges with young practitioners and uh, uh, young lawyers. Uh, I started my career as a university lecturer, so uh, I always find it uh, refreshing, I must say, uh, to engage in discussions uh, with young lawyers or aspiring lawyers. A, the International Court of Justice is the world court. It is the, as you said, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. 
uh, it has uh, several functions. The, mo the two most important ones are to uh, settle peacefully disputes between states and to give advisory opinions uh, to the other organs of the United Nations and to specialize it agencies of the UN system authorize it to request such opinions from the court by the UN General Assembly. A, it has also other functions as you as uh, international uh, law practitioners must be aware of. Because I don't think that there is a young practitioner uh, who has not come across the role of the court with respect to the development, progressive de development of international law. This court has substantially contributed to the clarification of issues of international law, to the progressive development of international law, and uh, to the interpretation uh, of uh, uh, various instruments, norms, rules of international law. So uh, these are the main functions of the court. And of course, the most important one, as I said, is the peaceful settlement of disputes among the states. As you know, the Charter of the United Nations prohibits uh, the use of force in international relations. And when the Charter uh, announced this principle, uh, the prohibition of the use of force in international relations, the Charter had to offer uh, to states something uh, to replace uh, this use of force because in the past, War was considered as the main uh, a, uh, instrument or tool uh, to resolve disputes between states. And so the International Court of Justice was created uh, to settle disputes between states. And since its creation in 1946, the court had to deal with 151 disputes which could have easily escalated into armed conflicts between states. Many of them actually were already at the stage of armed conflicts and therefore the court was able uh, to uh, uh, settle those disputes in a peaceful manner and in accordance with the rule of law. And this is what has given a certain measure of trust, confidence uh, to states to have uh, recourse uh, to the International Court of Justice. Because at the beginning, and you know that 100 years ago, when the first international permanent court of international justice was uh, to be established, there was a reluctance on the part of states to submit their differences, their disputes to an independent judicial uh, body. They preferred arbitration because they felt that they were going to nominate the uh, arbitrators and therefore they would have some influence. Uh, they were going to decide on the procedure for the arbitration. And they would have perhaps also a say in the choice of the uh, third arbitrator or the presiding arbitrator or the fifth arbitrator, whatever he was, the, the presiding arbitrator. So, but they, they wouldn't have such an influence on an independent panel of judges uh, who were elected in advance and the procedures of a court which were established in advance. And therefore they had some reluctance because they felt that uh, uh, maybe these judges uh, would uh, rule uh, against them uh, in a way uh, with which uh, they would not agree. Uh, they would interpret the law in a way with which they did not agree, etc. But it is the work of the court, the jurisprudence of the court, the quality of the judgment is of the court that has created among the states in the last 75 years, particularly in the last 75 years, 
a measure of confidence and trust in the International Court of Justice to the extent that the number of cases submitted to the court during its 50, fair, first 50 years, that is from 1947 to 1997, is more or less the same as the number of cases that have been submitted to the court in the last 23 years. So the number of cases have doubled in the last 23 years. And currently, the court has 17 cases uh, bending before it, uh, which is uh, quite a caseload for the International Court of Justice uh, in view of its uh, procedures and the way cases are, are handled before it. So uh, the court over the years uh, has been able to gain the trust and confidence of status because it has uh, contributed to the peaceful settlement of their disputes and to avoid armed conflicts, and at the same time to the development and clarification of international law. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, we, we are conducting this interview in the context of a global pandemic that has affected uh, all of us in, in our work. How is the court doing during this global health crisis and how is, the work, uh, how is your work in the practice of the court uh, being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, let me say first of all that we are all safe and well, and that's the most important thing for us, you know, because someone was asking me the other day, how are the judges? And I told him that they are all safe and well. So, and they have been working throughout this period. They have been working. And of course, we were at the beginning uh, caught by surprise uh, because uh, all of a sudden we had to uh, uh, lock down everything. And, uh, but uh, we immediately uh, took remedial action. And uh, we were able uh, to uh, start using uh, the appropriate technology uh, to have uh, me our meeting is first uh, by video link because uh, we had to have our meeting is in order to decide how to proceed. I am, of course, the president of the court, but I cannot decide everything by myself. So I had to have meetings with my colleagues. And the only way we could meet was by video link. And we met already uh, in March, uh, at the beginning of the, we had our first meetings in March and early April. And it is there that we decided that we should actually go ahead full steam and uh, adapt all our procedures, our methods of work, our rules uh, to the new situation. And uh, uh, hold our deliberations by video link, hold our plenary meetings by video link, uh, continue working on the cases that we had already heard, and also uh, hold the hearings of uh, cases that had not been been heard by video link, via video link. So uh, that's what we have done. Uh, we have uh, recently completed work on two cases uh, that had been bending. Uh, and uh, we had a, a public reading of those two cases about a week ago. Uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we had a hearing by video link of a case that spending and at the end of August and early September, we will also have two hearings uh, of, uh, of two cases uh, by video link and we will continue like that. So uh, we have not actually uh, uh, missed anything. Uh, we have been able to catch up uh, uh, with our uh, workload and our caseload and uh, uh, we uh, continue working and uh, carrying out uh, the judicial functions that were entrusted to us by the international community. 
Great. Well, that's great. Um, thank you. You've just mentioned that as president of the court, you, you don't decide uh, everything by yourself. And we also know that you're not the chief of all the, the other 14 judges. Uh, what, could you briefly, briefly tell us what is the role of the president of the court? What is your role? Uh, the president of the court is uh, one of the judges of the court and uh, he is uh, elected like the vice president by the other members, by his or her peers. And uh, you may consider him or her as a primus inter pares, but uh, he is not really, as you said, the chief of the uh, other judges. The judges are all on a, a footing of equality. They are all equal. And the president of the court has not only to act as president of the court, but he has or she has to continue working as a judge. And therefore, the first role of the uh, president of the court is the judicial one. And the judicial one has two aspects. Uh, one aspect is that of a normal judge. And the, 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 the president of the court has to give his opinions, his views or her views, whoever she is, a, uh, in the same way that other judges do. But the president of the court has also to lead uh, the judicial work of the court. And that is actually the most important aspect of his or her work. Because uh, judgment is, uh, are not easily uh, made or manufactured, as you can imagine. Uh, they take time. They take a lot of discussions, debates, deliberations by the members of the court. And they always require a majority. And it is therefore the president who has uh, to build a certain majority, if not consensus or unanimity, wherever possible, and to indicate where the majority lies. Um, the president has to make sure that a majority by the end of the day emerges as a result of the deliberations of the court and that there is no uh, some sort of a chaotic or messy situation in which nobody understands what the court has decided or is about to decide. So an orderly handling and development and elaboration of the judgment is of the court. That is what the president has to ensure. The president also handles case management, including the scheduling of cases with the support and assistance of the registry of the court. And of course, uh, the president uh, has to uh, uh, preside hearings, and deliberation is and oversee the process of producing the judgment in the sense of the elaboration of the judgment is and uh, in this context the president chair is the drafting committees because for each case one is the court decides or a majority one is a majority emerges with respect to uh, a judgment uh, then a drafting committee is elected and that drafting committee is presided by the president of the court. So uh, the president of the court is involved in the elaboration of the judgment from the beginning up to the end of the, up to its issuance. A, the president has also two other functions uh, which are very important for the court. Uh, the first one is the administrative function. And a, uh, although we have a chief administrative officer uh, uh, who is the registrar of the court, uh, the court supervises the registry. But the 15 judges cannot all supervise the registry. And so it is the president who supervises the registry on behalf of the court and therefore the registrar reports to the president. And if the president needs to consult the other judges, then 
he takes the matter before a plenary meeting of the court. The president all, has also diplomatic or representative functions because he is the face of the court. He represents the court uh, before other uh, principal organs of the United Nations. The president has to uh, present a report of the court uh, once every year to the General Assembly. He also brief, briefs once every year the Security Council of the United Nations in an informal uh, meeting and in which the Security Council and the President of the Court exchange views on dispute settlement, on the peaceful settlement of disputes in general, on the avoidance of conflicts and uh, this kind of things, and on the role played by these two important organs of the United Nations. And of course, the president of the court has to coordinate uh, closely with the secretary general of the United Nations uh, with respect to the work of the court, the budget of the court, uh, the administrative aspect is of the work of the court. And uh, uh, this, all this, uh, uh, in, in, in carrying out all these functions, uh, the president is, of course, assisted uh, by the registrar and by the registry of the court, which is the secretariat, in a way, of the court. Oh, okay, interesting. That's a very uh, expansive role with many interesting parts to it. Um, now, we will turn to your career path that we know that may, very many people are interested in hearing about. Um, during a Hague talk a few years ago, you told the audience that you got into law by accident. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit more about that accident? <laughs> a, uh, it was not actually when, you know, you, you never know as a young person at the age of 17 or 18, when you finish high school, you don't know what you want to do. Very few people know what they want to do. Uh, but uh, at least I had some sort of an idea and my idea was to study medicine. And I, uh, so I, I wanted to obtain a scholarship because there was no medical school at the time at the Somali National University. Uh, I wanted to obtain a scholarship to study uh, medicine abroad. And because of the uh, work which was carried out by the Ministry of Planning of Somalia at the time, uh, they did not include uh, enough uh, a posts for medical students in their planning so I was told uh, after I won the scholarship that uh, I would only be given the scholarship if I was uh, uh, willing to study engineering. And at that uh, actually water engineering, because that was uh, where the uh, ministry at the time wanted more people uh, to be trained uh, in the field of engineering, to be trained abroad. So I said, no, I am not interested in engineering and I don't know anything about mathematics and uh, whatever engineering may require. And uh, I decided to stay in Somalia and one of the faculties which were by then already functioning very well at the Somali National University was the faculty of law. So I decided to apply to the faculty of law and to study law. And that's how I came to law. But then, of course, uh, once I started studying law, uh, I did not know, know uh, in what kind of law I wanted to specialize. And uh, again, it was by accident, in a way, that I actually uh, stumbled, I should say, into international law. And I, uh, I found it quite interesting. I found it quite interesting because at the time, Somalia was involved in territorial disputes with its neighbors. And there was actually already an armed conflict with Ethiopia. And I thought that maybe international law could offer a solution to this kind of problems. 
And I discovered that the African Union, at the time it was called the Organization of African Unity, had a, a protocol on conciliation, mediation, and arbitration, uh, a protocol for the peaceful settlement of disputes. And I decided to do my thesis on that protocol. And uh, I wrote my thesis on that protocol, on the peaceful settlement of, duty, of disputes among African states. And that is how I started my career in international law. So uh, I never look it back uh, after that. I just continued on that career path. And uh, I did not, of course, uh, uh, expect at the time that uh, the peaceful settlement of disputes would occupy me throughout my life, uh, but uh, it has become part of me, and uh, I have been dealing with it uh, since that time. Uh, that's a fascinating, definitely a very different period uh, from when many of us are starting uh, in, in this field. Um, and just in that line, do you have any tips for young practitioners who aspire to have a career as successful as yours in international law? Um, for instance, we know that there are 15 legal associates or law clerks at the ICJ who assist, who assist the judges with their judicial work. What are the qualities, the top qualities that you look for in your own law clerks? Mm. Well, uh, I, I, I think that what matters most is uh, the passion that one brings to one's uh, uh, selected area of work or chosen area of work and the time and the energy that one devotes to it. I don't think that it is uh, uh, productive or useful to plan uh, in a way, a career and to say, oh, I'm going to follow that path. I never thought I would and, uh, come to the International Court of Justice. I didn't know much about the International Court of Justice, actually, as a matter of fact. Uh, I discovered it for the first time when I came to The Hague uh, to attend the Hague Academy. And when we met the president of the International Court of Justice at the time, and uh, we had a discussion with him. We asked him, how many cases do you have? And he told us, well, we have only one case. So we thought, well, this is a, a useless court. You know, it doesn't do anything. So one could not even aspire to become a judge at that time. You know, what are you going to do? And he was the only one who was in The Hague. All the other judges were in their respective countries because they did not really have cases. So uh, I don't think that it is productive to say I'm going to follow this path or that, that path. I think what matters most is that when I started international law, international law uh, was not uh, as interesting, as uh, uh, expansive, as uh, a widely known as it is today. Uh, actually, most of my colleagues at the Somali National University uh, were in a way laughing at me because uh, they were practicing law at the local courts. And they were asking me, what are you going to do with international law? Where are you going to practice it, you know? Uh, and what do you get out of international law? So uh, I, I think that uh, uh, it is the passion you bring to it. It is the energy you bring to it. It is the hard work that you bring to your chosen field which actually will make the difference. Now, as far as our law clerks are concerned, uh, what we look uh, for is their knowledge of international law in general. Uh, I always uh, advise young people against specializing too early. And I must say, uh, although I did a lot of work on the law of the sea as a young international lawyer, I did a lot of work on international economic law. I did a lot of work on intellectual property and you will see it in my publication, in my publications, publications of 30 years, 20 years ago, et cetera. I actually never felt that I was going to specialize in any branch of international law because I was all the time working on international law as a whole. 
And I think it is extremely important that young people should master, first of all, international law as a whole before specializing. And that is what happens. You see, we get a lot of applications for the positions of local artists. But then we realize that most of the young people who apply here had specialized it too early in human rights, international criminal law, uh, a, some other branch of international law, but did not really take enough time to study the basics of international law and to master the basics of international law. And therefore, some of them, of course, those who specialize it uh, too early do not succeed in the written exams that they have to take here. Uh, and they do not succeed in the interviews that they have to go through afterwards. So we look for a good and an in-depth knowledge of international law. And of course, we look for people who can draft very well, uh, either in English or in French, but who have at least a very good knowledge of one language and a passable knowledge of the other, because we work in both languages here, English and French. <clears throat> that's Great. It. Okay, that's extremely useful. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for your time. And uh, I will now hand over to Matthew, who will ask you uh, more specific questions about the role and practice of the International Court of Justice. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, Mr. President, we, we've um, seen a progressive growth in the last uh, few years in uh, the number of specialized international judicial bodies that exist. Um, I appreciate that this is a provocative question for the president of the International Court of Justice, but do you think that the world still needs uh, an international court of general jurisdiction like the ICJ? Yes, I think uh, more than the specialized court, as I would say. <laughs> uh, because uh, there is no dispute, uh, no difference uh, between states whether it is on environmental matters or whether it is on climate change or whether it is on diplomatic relations or whether it is even on trade and investment or whether it is on telecommunications or whatever. That cannot be brought before the International Court of Justice and the International Court of Justice will be able uh, to deal with it. Why? Because as you know, the statute of the International Court of Justice is the one actually which spells out and clearly establishes the sources of international law and how those sources of international law should be used by the court in order to uh, settle disputes uh, among states. So as long as you are in international law, uh, you need a court with general jurisdiction, which can uh, uh, handle all issues of international law, if there is a need for handling such issues of international law. Because the jurisprudence of this court and the quality of the judgments of this court are well known, and therefore there is a measure of predictability and certainty as to how this court will rule on certain issues of international law. And that matters, you know. The quality of the work of the court is what brings the status before it. So there is a need for that. And uh, of course, uh, we don't deal with international criminal law because individuals cannot come before us. Uh, but we deal with human rights law and we deal with humanitarian law. And uh, the court has had many cases uh, on human rights and has actually contributed 
to the evolution and development of human rights law at the international level. Because states can bring cases relating to human rights and to humanitarian law before the International Court of Justice. But individuals cannot come before us. So if it is a matter of individuals appearing before a court, that's not for us. That's not for the International Court of Justice. But as long as it is a matter for states uh, to appear before a court, uh, I think that you don't need too much specialized courts. You need a court of general jurisdiction which knows what it's doing. And I think states nowadays realize that the ICJ knows what it is all about and what it's doing. And so I think a connected theme um, to that, uh, Judge Yusuf, is um, one of fragmentation. There was a lively debate um, a few years ago about, about this. And in that context, um, former President Guillaume proposed um, that uh, the ICJ voiced the idea that the court um, should, uh, should serve as a court of appeal or review for judgments rendered by all other courts. Um, do you have a, a view on that proposal? Well, I must say that I personally have never actually uh, felt that there is a fragmentation of international law uh, because I don't think that you can find uh, that the judgment is issued by other courts have actually departed a lot and you will not find many examples that they have departed a lot from the interpretation given to international law in instrument is by this court. Normally, the jurisprudence of this court is followed by other courts. I have just mentioned it, the law of the sea. Uh, if you look at the jurisprudence of the ICJ on the law of the sea, uh, you will see that the International Tribunal on the law of the sea in Hamburg follows the jurisprudence of the ICJ. If you look at the jurisprudence of the ICJ on human rights and on international organizations and on UN organs, you will see that the European Court of Justice has actually uh, referred to the jurisprudence and followed it. If you look at the law of war and at uh, humanitarian law and the jurisprudence of the ICJ on humanitarian law, on the laws of war, you will see that the international criminal courts, starting with the ex-Yugoslavia uh, tribunal, uh, the Rwanda tribunal, the international criminal court have followed the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice. So I think that the International Court of Justice is already practically seen as an apex court. You know, it doesn't need to be designated as an apex court. And I think that uh, to be viewed as an apex court, it, is, it all depends on the quality, as I said, of your work and on the quality of your judgment. Even if you are de designated as, a, as the highest court in the world, but you don't have really judgments and jurisprudence which correspond to that, nobody will come to you and nobody will respect your jurisprudence and your judgments. The fact that you are given such a title does not mean anything. But I think the ICJ, without having such a title, has earned it by hard work and by the excellency of its jurisprudence and its judgments. And, and I think that you know, one of the reasons why um, we've seen over the past years um, ICJ judges appointed to um, arbitration tribunals is particularly for the excellence in the judgments that uh, the ICJ has rendered, as, as you mentioned. In, in your 2018 um, address to the United Nations General Assembly, um, you talked about this. Well, you talked about a connected theme. You explained that the members of the court had come to the decision that they would no longer accept to uh, participate in investor state and commercial arbitrations. Could you tell us a little bit about the considerations that led the members of the court to take that step? Yes, uh, 
I think that uh, it is easy to explain that because uh, a, before the International Court of Justice, there was the uh, Permanent Court of International Justice and the Committee of uh, Juristes of the uh, League of Nations discussed on the involvement of judges in international arbitration at the time. And they came to the conclusion that since the judges of the Permanent Court of International Justice were experienced international lawyers, uh, people who were respected uh, because of their knowledge and experience in the field of international law, uh, states uh, may need them or may need to nominate them as arbitrators in interstate arbitral uh, uh, tribunals. And therefore, they said that they should be allowed to sit in such tribunals. But at the time, we did not have investor state arbitration. And we did not have commercial arbitration at such a scale as it exists today. And so uh, these things are things which developed lately, uh, especially after the 1960s, the 1970s, etc. So our decision of uh, about two years ago actually did not take away the possibility for the judges of this court to sit in interstate arbitral tribunals. Because if the states feel more comfortable, instead of coming to our court, to refer their dispute to an arbitral tribunal, we have nothing against it. And if they ask one of the judges or two of the judges to serve on such a tribunal, that is actually our job. We, it is to help states to settle their disputes. But commercial arbitration and investor state arbitration are different. And since the number of those arbitrations keeps growing, and there was a risk that uh, the judges would get more and more involved uh, in such arbitrations, there was a need at a certain point uh, to draw a line somewhere on the sand, you know. And because of the growing caseload at the court, we felt that our members, the members of the court, could not afford, actually, uh, to help also uh, and to get our, out of their way to help in investor state arbitration. I know that their contribution is needed. But we have already too much on our plate. So that was one reason. The second reason was that there was a tendency on the part of certain states uh, to appoint a judge uh, as an arbitrator. Because if the judges were only appointed as presidents of investor state arbitral tribunals, that would have been different. But judges were being appointed also as arbitrators appointed by a party. And you know, when a state appoints an arbitrator and that some state, that same state comes before the court in a case, people might say, oh, yesterday he was appointed by this state and today he is sitting uh, in a case between that state and another state at the International Court of Justice. So we did not want that kind of perception, that kind of image associated with the members of the court. And therefore, we felt that it was better to uh, finish with this practice, to end with this practice, and to go back to the original idea that the judges of the court will only serve, if so authorized by the court, on interstate disputes whether those disputes are submitted to a judicial body or to an arbitral body. There they can uh, serve as arbitrators. That's what we have decided. And we have not actually excluded that possibility. Although up to now there are no judges uh, actually sitting in such arbitral bodies because most of the disputes are actually being referred to our court itself.
Thank you. Thank you again, Your Excellency. Um, we're now going to move on to some questions from uh, Panos about um, international dispute settlements a little bit more generally. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, Judge Yusuf, you have said that the UN Charter is the most innovative and trailblazing uh, blazing treaty in the history of international relations. What is the importance of this treaty um, as far as international dispute settlement is concerned? Well, I wrote a few uh, days ago an article in the uh, UN Chronicle, and uh, I would like to refer you actually to that article. Uh, and uh, I also gave a speech uh, uh, to the General Assembly on the 75th anniversary of the adoption of the Charter on 21 June uh, 2020. And I spoke in both cases about the Charter and about the judicial settlement of disputes, because I think uh, it is very difficult to uh, separate the two. But the Charter is not only about the peaceful settlement of disputes, because that is uh, uh, one, only one of the aspects in which the Charter has innovated uh, with respect to uh, the, for example, the, a, uh, the, the League of Nations. Uh, the, at the time of the League of Nations, the Permanent Court of International Justice was not part of the uh, covenant of the League of Nations. And its statute was not annexed to the covenant. It was a separate body to which the League could have recourse. But the International Court of Justice was built into the charter system. And the reason why it was built into the charter system is the uh, reason that I indicated before. Uh, if you prohibit the use of force, you have to offer something in lieu of that. And therefore, the International Court of Justice was created to settle the disputes between states. But for me, the Charter goes much further than that. Because, and the reason why I call it a trailblazing is because we don't have actually anything uh, like the Charter at the international level. N no multilateral treaty comes even close to the Charter of the United Nations in terms of innovation, in terms of adding uh, to uh, the body of international law that existed before, in, in terms of expanding the horizons of international cooperation and, uh, a, uh, and uh, of international law also in general. A, take for example, the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, which is in the Charter. You know, this is one of the most liberating principles in human history. It is thanks to that principle that half of humanity has been emancipated since the Second World War and since the establishment of the Charter. At the end of the Second World War, more than half of humanity was still under the colonial subjugation of other peoples. They were being oppressed. They were being subjugated. They were not considered as equals to their colonizers. But once you say that peoples are equal and you establish equality among peoples, colonization has no place in the world. And from 1960, Colonization was actually ruled through Resolution 1514 to be against the Charter of the United Nations and to be contrary to the principles of international law. So that is how most of the Asian countries, most of the African countries, most of the Caribbean countries acceded to independence. And this is a revolutionary concept. It is a revolutionary concept. Take human rights. The preamble 
announces of the Charter, the preamble of the Charter, announces and reaffirms faith in human rights uh, of the peoples of the United Nations. And there it is actually on behalf of the peoples that the governments uh, they reaffirm their faith in human rights. And it is starting from that point that the Universal Declaration on, on Human Rights has been elaborated, that the two covenants on human rights have been elaborated, that all the instruments that we know today have been elaborated on human rights, and that what has been achieved in the last 75 years in the field of human rights, because we have courts on human rights in Africa, in Latin America, or in the Americas, and in Europe. And it is all thanks to this, this tiny paragraph in the Charter of the United Nations, which reaffirms faith in human rights. It, is, it all started there. It all started there. And so the Charter is an extremely innovative and trailblazing instrument, which has really opened incredible perspectives and horizons for humanity. Because uh, we, I think when the Charter was adopted, nobody expected that we would be as interdependent and as globalized as we are today. Nobody could have foreseen that. But today that we are all affected by the same uh, uh, problems, uh, whether it is the COVID-19 or other health pandemics or a health crisis, when we actually uh, benefit uh, from the same technologies, uh, being able to communicate with each other the way we are doing today, uh, when we can travel uh, at a moment's no notice uh, from Australia and New Zealand to Africa and to the rest of the world, all this has been made possible by the rules and principles of international law and by the law on cooperation that has been established under the Charter of the United Nations. Without the Charter, we would not have been able to realize all this progress and prosperity. And therefore, for me, the Charter is the most revolutionary instrument that humanity has ever, ever adopted. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Yusuf. Now, in the interests of time, we're going to move to the last topic of today's webinar. Um, that topic is international law and arbitration in Africa, which I suppose is a topic close to your heart uh, since you were born in Somalia. And as you told us before, you started your studies uh, in Somalia. So the question is, um, in your keynote address at the African Arbitration Association conference last year, you mentioned that Africa needs to overcome divisions in legal and arbitral culture that are largely based on colonial legacies. How can the young practitioners uh, watching this webinar contribute to moving the continent towards a more uh, Pan-African arbitral and legal culture? I think they can do that. They just have to uh, decide that they can do it. Uh, because uh, you see, uh, the colonial powers have, have left a lot of divisions behind them for their own interest in Africa, and they want to perpetuate those divisions among African states, you know. So I hear about uh, French-speaking uh, African associations, English-speaking African associations, uh, Portuguese-speaking African associations. Uh, we are neither French-speaking, nor English-speaking, nor Portuguese-speaking. We are I am Somali speaking, and all Africans have their own language, and they should identify with their culture, and they should identify with their own countries in a proud manner, and they should not care about uh, colonial leg legacy, and therefore they should go beyond the colonial legacy and talk to each other and work together. And I think that uh, they can do that. 
And uh, if we try to see, for example, as far as the International Court of Justice is concerned, I can understand that some African countries, of course, uh, identify themselves as uh, civil law countries and others as uh, common law countries, etc. That's a legal tradition. Uh, but in terms of arbitration, uh, you can overcome that also. Because uh, here at the International Court of Justice, we are neither civil law nor common law. We are international law. And I think in terms of arbitration, if you are applying international law, then you reason, you interpret, you work on the base of international law. You don't work on the base of civil law or, uh, or common law. And therefore, those young people who want to really make their mark uh, in international arbitration, uh, they should perhaps learn more about uh, the commonalities of civil law and common law instead of trying to emphasize the differences between common law and civil law. And they should try to see how international law and especially Pro international procedural law overcomes those kind of divisions. And I think that uh, a, in Africa, that is the common approach that we need to adopt. And it can be easily adopted. But we need skilled young arbitrators who can actually show the way. And I hope that there are many who are actually uh, capable of doing that because it takes his courage, it takes his determination, it takes his perseverance, and I hope that they have all those qualities. Thank you very much, Judge Yusuf. Um, one last question uh, before this uh, webinar concludes, um, and it is related to what we have been discussing right now. You suggested to ICA to compile an archive of historical uh, arbitration cases involving African parties um, uh, from the 1900s to 1960, which is now on the ICA uh, website. Why do you consider this to be an important initiative? Well, because, you know, uh, we at the International Court of Justice, we publish our judgments. And uh, uh, for example, we had uh, uh, judgments on Southwest Africa and Namibia and we had advisory opinion on Namibia. And the young people of Namibia today can consult uh, what we said about their country and the decolonization of their country and the independence of their country. A, uh, African states that came before us uh, with a dispute, uh, their young lawyers, their politicians, know what we have decided about their countries and on what basis we took our decision. But most people in Africa, and sometimes actually governments have to disperse and to pay millions and, uh, of dollars, sometimes actually tens of millions of dollars uh, as a result of an arbitral award. And the people of the country do not know on what basis, why? Why did the government have to pay 50 million, 100 million to a foreign company, for example. If the young people in an African country, let's take Tanzania or Kenya or South Africa or uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, they want to actually see what happened. Most of them will not be able to find it. Uh, they will not be able to find how the case was decided against their government, against their country, and on what basis. But how do you expect them then to prepare themselves for future cases of that sort and uh, to uh, develop their skills in order to defend the interests of their countries? And this is not only in the area of uh, uh, investor state arbitration. It's also in commercial even arbitration between African enterprises and foreign enterprises. It is interstate arbitration, you know, and it is very difficult to find the records and the outcomes of all those arbitrations. They are all 
maybe can be found in London, Paris, Washington, Geneva, Zurich, wherever, uh, but not in African countries. They cannot be found in African universities. And I think this is something that can be easily remedied. And I hope it will soon be remedied. And whenever I address young practitioners from Africa, and I discuss with them about arbitration regarding African countries, they have no idea that such an arbitration took place, for example, in the 18th century, interstate disputes. 19th century, interstate disputes. Uh, that there were a uh, investment uh, or uh, a uh, treaties that were concluded between African states and European states with uh, clauses on arbitration uh, that were concluded already in the 18th century or the 19th century. And that such arbitration is took place also uh, in the early 20th century. Most of them are not aware of that. They are not even aware of the arbitration that took place in the 1960s and 70s. So I think it is very important that they get acquainted with this and that uh, they learn uh, about uh, uh, the decision is affecting or that have already affected uh, their countries, uh, their people uh, in the field of arbitration and that they can learn a lot from those decisions to prepare themselves for the future. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Yusuf, for all your uh, candid and enlightening uh, answers. I believe I speak on behalf of everyone uh, when I say that uh, it was a great honor and, and pleasure to have this conversation with you and to learn more about international uh, dispute settlement and the practice of the International Court of Justice. Um, if uh, someone had told us when we were studying law that one day we would be speaking with the president of the ICJ, I think we would have simply not believed him. So thank you very much for making this a special day on behalf of Young Ika and uh, of the, um, on behalf of Susan, Kimani and Matthew Morange as well. And, and with this, I would like to conclude uh, this webinar and remind our participants that Young Ika uh, has uh, two uh, webinars uh, in the pipeline. Uh, the first one will focus on cross-examination and the second on emerging jurisdictions in international arbitration. These webinars will take place on 31 July and 14 uh, August, and there's still time to left uh, for you to register. So thank you all very much and see you soon. Thank you.